Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. We're just going to give a couple of minutes for people to log into the Zoom and we will get started uh, right after one, one o'clock. All right, it looks like it's just about one o'clock. Uh, we do have a packed agenda today, so we are going to go ahead and get started. So welcome everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we have a really exciting webinar lined up, Pollinator Gardens 101. My name is Lily and I work for the Nature Conservancy in New Jersey. And today we are co-hosting this event with New Jersey Audubon. We're very excited for this webinar. And it's definitely a timely topic since spring is right around the corner and it's just about time to get started with gardening. Next slide, please. So today we will be hearing from our two guest speakers. <clears throat> Erica Yuryev has worked for the Nature Conservancy New Jersey chapter as our Cape May stewardship assistant for just over a year. She spends most of her time at our Cape May preserves. An avid gardener, she has participated in the Atlantic County Master Gardeners Program and was previously employed as a, a horticulturist assistant at Mount Cuba Center, a botanical garden in Delaware. Some of her favorite garden activities include growing native plants from seed, letting her lawn turn into a meadow and watching plants wake up in the spring. If you see her at the preserves this summer, be sure to say hello. We're also joined by Adele Schwaderer from New Jersey Audubon. Adele is a birder and nature enthusiast who was first introduced to the wonders of Cape May in 2018 when she worked as an interpretive naturalist for the Cape May Bird Observatory. Since then, she has worked for various organizations delivering educational programs. She pursued her master's degree in environmental education and parks and resource management, and she eventually found her way back to Cape May as the program coordinator for the Cape May Bird Observatory. In this role, she helps facilitate a wide array of birding programs and outreach opportunities throughout the year. Next slide, please. So for those of you who follow TNC closely, our presenters today may look familiar to you. 
They were um, both at a event that TNC hosted last summer called Monarch Mania at the Garrett Family Preserve. While Erica and Adele were there, they were giving educational tours and talks. I would be remiss to be co-hosting a webinar about pollinators without giving the Garrett Family Preserve a shout out. This preserve has over four acres of pollinator habitat and it has a stunning statue that represents one of the most iconic pollinators, the monarch butterfly, which unfortunately has landed on the endangered species list. If you ever find yourself in the Cape May area, please visit this preserve. I promise you won't regret it. And I'll be sure to put a link in the chat so you can learn more about this preserve. Next slide, please. All right, and so before we get started with the presentation, I just have a couple of housekeeping items to go over. Um, so for starters, uh, we do have closed captions enabled for this webinar. To access them, just select the um, Show Captions button towards the bottom of your screen. And just a friendly reminder, you can move the caption box. If you find that it is getting in the way of the presentation, you can just move it to a different portion of your screen. We have the Q&A feature turned on for this webinar, so please be sure to put all of your questions in that Q&A feature box. Um, there will be time at the end to answer most of your questions, so feel free to put them in as the presentation goes on. And lastly, this webinar is going to be recorded and we will upload it to our YouTube channel. We'll also be sending a link to the recording in a follow-up email sometime early next week. Okay, so that is everything you needed to cover. Um, I will happily turn it over to you, Erica, so we can learn about pollination and uh, New Jersey's native pollinators. Thank you, Lily. Um, I'm really excited to talk about this topic and to have such a large group is interested in saving our pollinators. Um, before Adele speaks to us about creating a pollinator garden, I'll give some background on pollinators themselves. So if, you, if you could do me a favor, think of a plant. Odds are you thought of a seed plant. Seed plants make up about 90% of all land plant species and include trees, flowers, and grasses. The plant's pollen grains contain genetic, genetic material and the movement of the pollen from the male part of a flower or cone, also known as the anther, to the female part, the stigma, for fertilization is the process of pollination. Whether the flowers belong to the same or two different individuals, it results in offspring that are genetically different than either parent. The importance of pollination. Uh, once fertilization occurs, the plant can produce seed, fruit, and maintain their populations. Without pollination, wild populations would decline, and with them, all the ecological services that they provide, such as carbon sequestration, stabilization of soil, and climate, climate moderation. Seed and fruit only occur after pollination and allow a species to expand or move to new, perhaps more suitable habitat. Because cross-pollination leads to a population with genetic diversity, it makes species survival more likely. The way I like to think of it is if there are individuals in a group with different traits, it is more likely that one of these individuals will have a trait that helps it survive something like a hardship, a drought, or a disturbance. Basically, genetic diversity in a population allows a species to adapt to change in an environment. Plants rely on vectors such as water, wind, or animals to move their pollen. Many trees and all grasses and sedges are wind pollinated. About 80% of all pollinated plants need animals to pollinate them, and these animals are the pollinators that we are talking about today. Some pollinators, like bees, collect pollen intentionally. Others, like butterflies or hummingbirds, move pollen accidentally while visiting flowers for nectar. Pollen sticks to their bodies and is transported to the next flower that they visit. While birds, bats, and in some parts of the world, even lizards also pollinate, the majority of the work is done by insects. Native pollinators and native plants co-evolved for millions of years. Think back to dinosaurs. Pollination is a mutually beneficial relationship in which the animals get food and the plants reproduce. On the slide, you'll see a lot of examples of bees. Bees are often the top pollinators because they collect pollen on purpose, have hairs that pollen readily sticks to, and move between flowers quickly, often sticking to the same species of plant, 
making successful pollination more likely. There are about 4,000 native species of bees in North America and 350 species in New Jersey. Other insect pollinators include moths, butterflies, beetles, wasps, and flies. A quick note on honeybees. Honeybees are not native. They are managed pollinators, which makes them very versatile because they can be moved um, and they can be very helpful for farming, but beekeeping does not replace or help our native pollinators. As you can see, moths, beetles, and butterflies are some of our more beautiful pollinators. This is a really interesting chart I wanted to show today because it shows the intricate coevolution of pollinators and plants. Often the characteristics of the flower reveal who its pollinators are. The smell, shape, color, and other characteristics of flowers attract certain pollinators and ensure they are able to access the pollen. One of the coolest examples I think is that the flowers that moths pollinate emit their scent at night when moths are active. Just like flowers, pollinators come in various shapes and sizes. So when selecting plants to support them, which we'll talk about later, we need to keep these characteristics in mind and aim for a variety of flower types. The importance of pollinators is multifold and we have to keep in mind that helping them helps us in many ways. As I mentioned, pollinators are a vital part of maintaining plant populations. In particular, they are important in fragment, fragmented landscapes because they're able to carry pollen over a larger distance, connecting otherwise disconnected populations. They also play an important role in ecological food webs, not only through their participation in plant reproduction, but also the fruit and seeds derived from insect pollination are a major part of the diet of many birds and mammals. Pollinators are also food themselves. Just think of all the baby birds that are fed caterpillars in the springtime. Many of our food crops and plant-based products rely heavily on insect pollination. Yield in some crops can decrease by as much as 90%. And a diversified approach to pollinators in agriculture leads to minimized risks and stabilized yields. In New Jersey, wild pollination contributes $33 million to farm revenues, supporting the people that feed us. Native insect pollination in the US agricultural economy saves nearly $3 billion through natural crop production. And globally, pollination services are estimated to be worth $3 trillion. This graphic shows how dependent some foods are on pollinating insects. As you can see, there are uh, lots of examples of fruits, seeds, and nuts, especially cocoa beans. If you guys know, this is very important for a lot of our mental health. In the US, more than 150 food crops depend on pollinators and about 10% of the human diet is dependent on insect pollination. So what are the threats to pollinators? Habitat loss, degradation, and fragmentation are all a problem. These lead to loss of feeding, nesting, and overwintering habitat. This also means that existing habitats may be too small to support stable populations. Also, the distance between suitable habitats might become too great for pollinators to traverse. Another huge threat is pesticide use, which not only kills pollinators um, if it's used as a form of insecticide, but also herbicides will kill their forage plants. And it's important to keep in mind that pesticide isn't only used in agriculture. Um, a lot of it is found in rural and suburban settings. Other threats include climate change. Um, as you may have noticed, a lot of the Flower, trees and flowers are blooming now. Um, climate change can cause flowering plants and their pollinators to become out of sync with each other, throwing off their timing. Disease and non-native plants, which can outcompete natives, um, are also an issue. While there haven't been sufficient studies on all pollinators, it's evident that insect populations in general are declining. 
In terms of pollinators specifically, 28% of North American bumblebees face the risk of extin extinction and 19% of moths and butterflies. So what is it that they need? They need nesting and overwintering sites. 90% of our native bees are solitary with females nesting on their own. And of those native bees, 70% nest underground and 30% nest in stems and wood cavities. Social bees like bumblebees nest in trees, crevices in rocks, burrows found in the ground and under grass tussocks. Many insects like the bumblebee queen shown here overwinter in leaf piles or brush piles. They also need food for all life stages. Native pollinators have evolved with native plants and rely on them for food and shelter. Butterflies and moths need host plants for their larvae. Because different pollinators are active at different times of year, continuous nectar and pollen sources throughout the seasons is important. And like I mentioned, flowers with varying shapes, colors, and characteristics are necessary to support a variety of pollinators. They also need safe places, which means pesticide-free areas, free from disturbance, areas to seek refuge from predators and weather. What they really need can be summed up in the fact that they need our help. Even if a pollinator garden is more than something you can do, there's a more ecological way to manage your yard. What you can do is avoid pesticides. This includes not buying plants grown using neonicotinoids, which are systemic insecticides that can stay in a plant for years and affect the insects that pollinate them. In terms of your lawn, you should avoid using herbicides on the weeds if you can help it. Um, you can even mow higher, allow the clover to flower and let the bees feed on it. Um, mow less or even replace some parts of your lawn because it doesn't support very many living things. You can leave the leaves in the fall because many insects such as the bumblebee queen that I mentioned earlier and butterfly larvae overwinter in them. You can either use them as mulch in your garden beds or set them aside to break down into leaf mold to be used later as mulch or soil amendment. You can leave stems and flower stalks as shelter and nesting sites for native bees. You can leave bare soil so that bees have access to the ground for nesting and avoid covering areas with a lot of mulch, plastic and landscape fabric. Also avoid deep tilling so that you don't disturb ground nesting sites. Another thing you can do is remove invasives with which outcompete native plants. There are also small additions that you can make to your garden. Uh, as I mentioned, native plants are best. So if you have old or dying plants or invasive plants, they can be removed and replaced with a native species that fills a missing niche in your yard. If you have limited space, you can plant in pots. Create a brush pile, add logs and rock piles for shelter and nesting sites. You can even add a tree or a bush because these plants host many insect species. For example, an oak tree alone can support 500 species of insects. In other words, it's okay to start small. Either way, whether you're in installing a large pollinator garden or making a small change to your existing yard, you'll be making a big difference to pollinators. All right, thank you so much, Erica, for the first half of that um, of our presentation. Um, as Lily said in the beginning, my name is um, uh, um, Adele Schwaderer, and I'm the program coordinator for the Cape May Bird Observatory. Um, and I'm going to be covering um, the portion that's a little bit more specific to pollinator gardening. Um, but to kind of start off this segment, um, I wanted to touch on just goals of gardens in general. Um, much of our landscape um, across the um, uh, um, um, across the U.S. are lawns, um, which um, we've already talked about how they um, aren't very good for um, a wide variety of native um, plants and animals, as um, a lot of things don't utilize um, such a barren area. But the but um, the goal of our um, 
um, of this talk isn't to get you to use all of your lawn for gardens. Um, you can just allocate a small portion of your property for um, uh, the um, uh, like native plants and um, and um, uh, wildlife while also utilizing a portion of your lawn for sports or for hanging out out there. Um, and in general, no matter what kind of gardening you're trying to do on your property, um, it should um, uh, be able to provide resources for the survival of wildlife while also being a space for you to enjoy. So some things to keep in mind whenever you're designing your garden, um, whether um, that be a um, uh, 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 pollinator garden or not, you want to think of food, water, cover, places to raise young, and then um, uh, um, utilizing different um, sustainable practices, um, which we have already talked about um, um, a little bit. So um, we can go to the next slide, please. So the first um, thing to think about is food, and I'm going to touch on some different plants that you can plant in your garden that will naturally provide food um, for um, uh, the different insects and um, a variety of wildlife in your garden, um, like pictured here um, on the left um, corner there is a, um, a milkweed plant with a um, uh, monarch caterpillar on it. And so uh, that is a naturally occurring thing you can add into your garden that will provide um, that caterpillar um, with its um, vital food source um, for it to be able to grow into a um, butterfly, but you can also uh, provide different types of food through feeders. So on the right here, we have um, a variety of bird feeders. And depending on the types of birds that are um, native to your area or birds you would like to bring into your property, you can select different feeders. Um, if you're just trying to get a general variety of birds, you can get a mix that, um, that has um, sunflower seeds in it, um, which is a favorite of a lot of backyard birds. Um, if you live in Jersey and would like to see our state bird, which is the um, goldfinch, you would want to put up a um, smaller thistle theater. Um, those seeds um, are a specialty of um, the um, of the finch group. Or you can also put up suet, um, which uh, is great for woodpeckers and um, nuthatches, and is a great thing to put up in the winter as well because it's, it has high fat content, and so that can really um, help support the birds and make sure that they make it through the harshest part of the year. Uh, lastly, the feeder that may not be as common to most um, on the webinar is in the top left, um, and that's actually a fruit feeder um, where you put out fruit that um, you may have not been able to eat in time, um, and uh, you can attract a lot of moths and butterflies. Um, as that um, as the fruit decays, they fly in to suck up the sugar, um, just like if you ever see um, uh, butterflies and things at your um, um, at your hummingbird feeder, they're kind of doing the same thing. Um, if you do put one of these in your yard, um, I would recommend not putting it close to a back door because it does bring in really cool butterflies and moss like um, the um, uh, like the viceroy, which is pictured here, which is um, a um, butterfly that looks similar to the monarch. Um, but it can also bring in wasps and um, um, and um, uh, some other stinging insects. Um, not that they're not good to bring into your property, but you wouldn't want to scare one and then um, get stung. But having a feeder like this um, is really cool because you may be able to get the opportunity to um, view insects that you might not normally come across in your yard. Next slide, please. Second is um, a great source of water. So that can be um, in a pond or a um, like water feature that you plan to add into your garden permanently, um, but it also doesn't have to be that drastic. You could even just put in a, um, a dish on the ground that is about two inches deep, um, and that's great for birds um, and um, for other small mammals to be able to drink from and then also bathe in. Um, if you look at the tray featured on the left hand side of the screen, that is a dish that has rocks in it and that's actually specialized for bees to um, utilize and um, some other insects which also need to be able to drink clean water, um, but you obviously don't want them to drown um, in a dish like that. So if you put rocks in it, um, that can allow them to fly onto the rock and sit and drink, or if they do fall into the dish, they can crawl out and not drown. Um, and 
with any kind of water feature that you put on your property, um, you want to make sure that um, if it's a dish that you um, refill it um, um, every two to three days um, to keep out um, uh, like bug larvae. Um, and then also once a week, you want to scrub it down with a brush just to keep all of the um, like algal growth out of there. Um, but yeah, it doesn't have to be this big like water feature in your yard um, to be able to provide water for um, animals. Next slide, please. Um, the next is cover. So um, uh, just like Erica said, you can leave your leaves on your lawn um, to um, give cover to um, a variety of um, uh, things over the winter, but you can also um, put in a like wood pile in a corner of your um, of your property if you have to take down a tree or even if you do um, pruning in the spring, you can create a nice um, brush pile which can be utilized throughout the warmer months um, by um, birds and um, some other mammals um, as shelter. But also overwintering, um, there are certain um, reptiles um, like, um, snakes and turtles that need um, places to overwinter that are warmer and then also certain butterflies actually overwinter as um, um, uh, adults and so they need to be able to survive the winter before they can come out in the spring and lay their eggs so having a wood pile like this um, or some kind of larger pile of um, debris is great and then just even not um, mowing underneath a stand of trees and kind of letting um, the um, uh, like underbrush grow up is a great place for um, for a variety of um, animals to hide and take refuge as well. Next slide, please. Um, another thing you can do in your yard um, and in your garden is um, provide places for um, wildlife to nest. You can put in your own um, nest box, which pictured here are two um, Eastern um, screech owl um, uh, babies in a nest box. A lot of birds require cavity nesting um, opportunities in order to raise their young, which um, historically um, would be supplied by dead trees. But um, we like to kind of cut down dead trees. Um, and sometimes it um, you can't leave one up in your yard because if it falls, it'll fall on your house or cause other structural damage. Um, but if there's ever a possibility that you can leave a tree up um, that um, is dead, you may have your own type of um, birds nesting in there, or you may get some um, birds that are eating the um, things that are kind of taking advantage of the dead wood in your yard. Or you can put up a box, um, not just for owls, but for bluebirds um, or tree swallows, things like that. Um, and then by even just having trees or shrubs on your property is a great way to um, provide um, opportunities for a variety of birds to build their nests as well. Next slide, please. And lastly, um, in your garden and on your property, you want to use um, uh, practices that um, are good for the um, general ecosystem. So if you have a cat, um, if you could please keep your cat indoors, um, because not only do cats um, across the country kill um, millions of birds every year, but also they hunt um, other small mammals. Um, and so they are just um, kind of a big predator for songbirds in general. Uh, as well as you can put in a rain barrel, which is great. Um, once you put in your beautiful new garden, uh, you can utilize rainwater instead of um, water from the tap um, to be able to water your garden. You can secure the top of it with a lid or a mesh screen so that um, there aren't any bugs laying eggs in your water. Um, but then you can take that screen or that top off and fill up your watering can, or you can hook up a hose like the one pictured here, and that way you can save um, water and that way and you'll always have a source of water for your garden. Lastly, something um, that is good to think about is mulch and where you put your, mar put your mulch. Um, it's great for your garden um, as a way to maintain moisture so that that water you're using lasts longer or the rainwater that you are utilizing um, really is held closer to the top of the, of the soil and that way it's uh, has longer access or the roots of your plants have longer access to it. However, you don't want to put your mulch too close to the base of trees or to the base of your shrubs. Um, if you've ever seen trees that have mulch like piled up above the roots touching the main 
um, trunk of the tree, that isn't always good because as I mentioned, the mulch holds moisture. And so holding in that moisture close to the trunk of the tree or close to the roots of your, or to the, um, to the stems of your plants can actually cause the wood to rot and then it can kill the plant. So just thinking about strategically where you put that mulch and how much you lay out is also important. Uh, next slide, please. All right, now we're getting to um, the pollinator gardening basics. So the first thing you want to think about whenever you're designing your pollinator garden is what space you would like to pick. So um, you would want your garden to um, uh, gain at least six hours of direct sunlight per day. Um, and that is because um, the things that we that will be visiting your garden, um, like our moths, butterflies, or our um, butterflies, bees, um, and things like that, they need the sun for, um, to be able to fly around um, as they don't, um, they are more active in sunlight. So you wanna pick a nice sunny spot um, so that uh, the, the insects will be able to utilize it um, to the best of their ability. Next, you wanna think about your soil. So um, before you're planting, uh, in an area, you want to test your soil drainage. Um, and the way you do that is you dig a circular hole about six inches into the ground and you want to fill that hole with water. And then if you're if you come back in one hour and your hole is drained completely of water, then um, that is a good spot to, to put your um, to put your garden as water. Um, it will be held there for the plants to utilize, but then it'll drain away um, and it won't um, retain that water too long and become too wet because not a lot of plants really like super wet roots. Um, however, if you're if you come back in one hour and that water is still full in that hole, then that might not be the best spot. Um, you could put in um, uh, like French drains or other things in your yard to help um, navigate water away from that area. Um, or you may be able to kind of um, pick a higher spot um, up on your property. There are also plants that really thrive in wet um, uh, wet spots. So if that's a problem you're having whenever you're trying to plant plants, you can definitely um, select for plants that are more adapted to wet roots. Um, additionally, you want to figure out what your soil type is on your property um, and add in compost um, or um, some of that leaf litter we were talking about back into the soil um, to kind of increase um, the nutrient density. Uh, you can buy soil testing kits or you can really just kind of go out and grab some soil and put it in a jar and let it with water and then let it separate and you can kind of see what mix of silt, sand, um, or loam, or clay is in your, um, is, or that makes up your property. And that'll really help you determine um, what plants will thrive there, but then also how much um, compost or things you need to add in, um, in order to make that, um, that area as um, successful as possible for your pollinators. Um, and of course, you want to take out any weeds or um, debris from that area. Um, if you are dealing with a completely, like a normally mowed lawn, you wanna take out all of the grass from that area and um, make sure it's just dirt um, to start with instead of having the seeds try to compete with the grass that is there. And we can go to the next slide. So here um, I have maps specifically for um, the state of New Jersey. Um, the map on the left is talking about um, the different soil types. So we're down, or I'm here in, in Cape May County, which is all the way down at the bottom. And so we're in um, the tertiary zone. And so that's a mix of sand, silt, and clay. So now that mixture isn't consistent across that entire yellow region, but that kind of gives you a baseline of the soil type there. And then you can see how sandy or how silty or how much clay is in your soil and kind of move from there. And obviously, um, um, I'm going to be focusing on plants that are common in South Jersey, but there are maps like this um, for um, for all states out there. Um, and really, you want to take a good look at your environment around you and what you think will be best supported in your landscape. Um, I love um, the plant mountain laurel, and it's really common up in like the rockier areas um, up in Pennsylvania, but I wouldn't want to plant it down here because it wouldn't do well with all of that sand and it's not used to the extra salty breeze and things like that. So even a plant that you might really want to plant might not 
thrive in your backyard. And so you may be able to find a plant that looks similar to the one that you have um, thinking or that you've been thinking of in, in your head, but will um, that is um, more local to your area and that will adjust better to the local climate and weather patterns and the soil types. So you wanna set your plants up for success. Same thing with the map on the right, just kind of breaks down um, the different zones um, across New Jersey. So we're in the outer coastal plain. So similar thing here, you wouldn't want to plant um, plants that were better suited to um, uh, the um, like Piedmont area um, of Jersey. Um, so you just want to be able to take a look at your area to make sure that you um, aren't spending money or time trying to install plants and things like that that aren't necessarily fit for your area. Next slide, please. So what plants to select once you've picked your area and you've prepared it, what plants are we gonna put in there? So the short answer is um, native plants. So these are plants that are, um, that, um, are native to your area um, and that are capable of thriving in your ecosystem that you're living in. So um, you wanna focus your plant selection on native perennial plants that provide food at all stages for pollinators. So um, for the larval stage and for the um, adult stage of um, these pollinators. This means selecting plants that, that provide pollen and nectar rich um, uh, foraging opportunities for adult pollinators and other beneficial insects, as well as the larval or um, uh, um, caterpillar food plants for butterflies and moths. So a lot of people love monarchs and they deserve all of the love. They're incredible insects. And so people love planting milkweed, which is great. Um, that is because the monarch needs milkweed in order to lay their eggs on, um, on that plant because the caterpillars need that plant to survive. The caterpillars need to eat um, that plant specifically in order to grow into the butterfly. And additionally, the flowering part of the milkweed plant, um, you know, feeds a variety of um, butterflies and insects as well. However, you wouldn't just want to plant a garden of milkweed because once those, um, once those butterflies um, hatch, they need a variety of nectar sources. Um, and you wouldn't wanna just try to bring in one species to your yard, you know, you wanna have um, quite, a, quite a variety. Um, on top of that, you should also strive for your garden to provide consistent and um, uh, um, um, adequate floral resources throughout the season. So what that means is a variety of plants bloom at different times in the year. And they're split into early, middle, and late blooming. So kind of going down to, or going back to the thought of you wouldn't wanna just plant one type of plant in your garden. Um, you wanna think about when those plants bloom so that no matter what time of the year that you're, um, that you have um, birds and um, birds and things um, utilizing your property, uh, you would want them to be able to find food. So thinking about um, when they bloom and flower and things like that. So we can go to the next slide where I've kind of broken down um, some of the plants that are native to South Jersey and that thrive down here. Um, and ones you might want to think about um, putting a, a um, variety in. So ideally you'd want to put in three plants from each blooming stage in your pollinator garden, just to provide an adequate amount of food for these pollinators. So the first one here is wild columbine. They have really cool um, uh, kind of like trumpet shaped petals here. And then we have um, hairy beard tongue. Uh, they have like this really unique shape um, and there is a variety of colors in this one as well. And then I have wild blue indigo. Um, so these are all great. They bloom early. So from like April to May, they will bloom. Then we have mid blooming plants, which um, uh, one of those ones is our uh, milkweed plant. This is common milkweed, but also um, swamp milkweed and butterfly milkweed also are mid bloomers. Um, so this is another popular one to have in your garden. And then we also have great blue uh, lobelia, um, which is another mid blooming plant, um, as well as black eyed Susans, which are super common. So these are all ones that will bloom like from the end of May into June 
um, and maybe into a, a little bit of July. And lastly, we have late blooming plants. So here we have um, Joe Pye weed. Um, and then in addition, we have seaside goldenrod, but really um, all of our goldenrods, at least down here in Jersey, they are um, late bloomers. So there's a, a wide variety of goldenrod, um, but this is, if, um, if you love monarchs, um, you would definitely wanna plant goldenrod in your garden because on their migration back down to Mexico, um, they don't need milkweed anymore because they're not laying eggs. They really need to bulk up and um, get as much nectar in them in order to make it back to Mexico. So these late blooming plants, um, especially goldenrod along the coast are crucial to their survival and making it back to Mexico. And lastly, we have um, New England aster. Um, once again, there's a variety of aster species. Um, so even if this aster isn't common in your area, um, asters are a great thing to put in there as well. So when to plant. Um, if you wanna start your plants from seed, then you have to um, determine your seeding date. So most native wildflowers are best um, planted in late fall, so mid to early December. And that's because uh, the seeds need to go dormant, um, which is why this um, seeding date is called fall slash dormant seeding. So a lot of the plants, um, or a lot of the seeds, um, they need to be cold stratified, which means they need to be spread in late fall and they need to be exposed to the cold in order to germinate in the spring. So you spread them, um, they, you know, um, they go through their first frost and then that uh, lets them know that as soon as spring hits and it gets warmer, they can then go through the process of um, germinating and um, actually sprouting into plants. Spring seeding takes place between mid-April to the end of May. And these, de and these dates coincide with the last spring frost dates depending on your location. So you wanna look at uh, your state and then also um, when, when the last frost date will be. And that's whenever you wanna spread your seeds in April, um, because if you spread your seeds and then the frost hits, they won't, um, they, they don't need to be cold stratified. So the cold will just kill them and they won't germinate. But huge caution here, um, seeding after June 1st is just horrible because it'll, um, you'll have a lot of uh, weed competition and that will take a lot of effort on your part to control your weeds while trying to maintain your seed growth because since the seeds are, you know, they're starting out super, super small and um, they can be easily kind of snuffed out by the pressure of other quicker growing plants like weeds. Um, so you definitely want to have all of your seeding done, I'd say, like by mid-May, um, just because the weeds are already awful year round, but in the summer, I'm sure you all know, it's just a constant battle. Next slide, please. So seeds versus plants. So, um, you know, the choice between planting your or spreading your own seeds or planting your own um, you know, pre-bought, um, pre-bloomed or, or pre, you know, grown plants is really the choice um, depends on your timeline and your budget. So seeds are cheaper and um, they are great for larger gardens, um, but will require more time in order to um, take root. So if you're using seeds, you got to plan on um, spreading them the fall or late winter ahead of your summer growing season. Um, and this time will give the seeds, um, the, the adequate amount of germination time. Uh, nursery started plants cost more, but will generally give you a quick um, return on your investment and bring um, and bring pollinators into your yard during the same growing season. So if you're on um, um, if you're on this talk now and you want to kind of tackle your um, your pollinator garden this spring. I would say kind of do all of the prep work to like for the whole area you would like to include. And then depending on your budget, buy a few really nice staple plants that will return year after year. And then based on what survives and what your garden looks like by um, September, October, you can get your own seed mix or a, a variety of seeds that need to be dormant over the winter and kind of fill in those gaps and keep weeding. And that way this time next year, you'll be, um, uh, really excited to see what blooms and things like that. So that would be um, my recommendation. Uh, next slide, please. So um, where to get your plants? Um, this is a screenshot I got from um, one of um, our stewardship 
um, coworkers that um, has access to um, a lot of, or has made connections at a lot of variety of local um, uh, plants, uh, nurseries around us. So this uh, includes uh, Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Um, this, I can make sure this gets sent out with uh, the email at the end um, to all of you. But um, if you don't have, or if you don't live in Pennsylvania or Jersey, uh, you can kind of ask like your local garden club or just look around for a local nursery um, that sells um, a lot of great local plants. And then lastly, on the other slide, we have um, resources. Um, as Lily mentioned, she'll be sending out an email and there'll be clickable links to um, specific sites um, related to these, um, um, uh, these um, organizations plus um, a ton more. But um, yeah, the, and if for some reason uh, you are in an area where um, these aren't, um, aren't um, uh, relevant to you, I would um, uh, um, I would um, recommend going to your local garden um, like garden center and just asking around. And I'm sure there's like a local garden club as well. Those are also great um, resources for how to plant things and things like that. So, with all of that, um, those are all of my thoughts on pollinator gardening. And I'll turn it back over to Lily for the Q and A portion. Thank you so much, Adele and Erica. Um, that was awesome. And um, I just want to give a quick shout out. I'm sure everyone here can see all of their social media handles up on the screen. Um, before we open to the Q&A, I just want to encourage everyone to give us a follow so you can stay up to date with our work and upcoming future events. Um, off the top of my head, I know that Audubon has some really exciting events coming up, um, a World Series of Birding and the Cape May Spring Festival. So definitely follow us on social media to stay up to date. And um, as Adele mentioned, um, I will be sending out that follow-up email with a list of all of the resources and additional readings that both Adele and Erica noted during this presentation, as well as that list of the nurseries that she just had on the screen. Um, so we're going to open up the floor for some questions. Um, so feel free, I see there's already a ton in the chat, but if you, if you have any more, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box and we will do our best to answer them with the uh, the remaining time that we have. Okay, so let's see here. First question that we have, and um, Adele or Erica, feel free um, to, to hop in and answer. Um, are cattails beneficial for pollinators? I, I am, I, they are. They're a really great alternative to um, the non-native um, Phragmites which is really common down here. Um, I don't know specifically which insects utilize them, but I know um, a variety of them do, but I don't know if um, uh, um, Erica has any other specific, but. No, unfortunately, I'm not very familiar with, with cattails as, as uh, pollinator plants. Yeah, but they're, they're great to put in a really like wet spot in your yard. Um, but yeah, I, I know, and especially, um, we were talking about solitary bees and things like that. Um, if you leave up your cattails, or even if you leave up your um, like dead plants, they utilize the stalks of those to overwinter. So um, we all love to have a really clean, pristine lawn for winter, like with nothing dead in there. But if you can suffer through kind of looking at your dead plants for um, the winter, they can be really great places for um, your pollinators to overwinter as well. So it sounds like maybe also the stalks could be used for, I know people like to build those little um, pollinator houses or pollinator hotels, I think they're sometimes called. Um, so maybe the cats, the cattail stalks would be a good purpose for that as well. Mm -hmm. awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so next question here. Uh, I believe this might be a question for Erica because I think this was one of your topics. Um, so how does beekeeping have a negative impact on native pollinators? Um, it doesn't necessarily have a negative in impact. I just wanted to get across that it is not a form of conservation of native bees. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Um, let me see here. Okay, this is a great one. So how do you know if a plant that you have purchased um, does not have the pesticides that were mentioned? Are they specifically labeled? 
they I I would ask before you buy it. Um, they sh I, I believe there are laws about labeling neonicotinoids. I'm not sure what they are here in New Jersey. I don't know if Adele knows, um, but ideally they would be labeled or wherever you're buying it from, I would just double check that they aren't. Um, if you're buying from a native plant nursery, I would assume that they wouldn't be using seeds that are um, covered in neonicotinoids and they probably wouldn't be using neonicotinoids mm -hmm. on their plants either. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So it sounds like best practice is to just ask the experts and they can guide you in the right direction. <laughs> Um, next question here. Um, so, all right. So Holly says, I have never heard of a fruit feeder. How do we know when the fruit is too old and not safe anymore for the butterflies? Um, I would give it, so um, I use kind of the same principle um, with um, um, hummingbird feeders. If you have a hummingbird feeder, you should be filling it and cleaning it on the same day every week. So um, you want to take that inside, empty it out, kind of give it a good scrub with soap and water, rinse it, and then refill it with your um, sugar water mixture. And I would do the same thing with, um, like I would, I honestly would do that maybe twice a week just because it is like rotting fruit. So, and also if it's super hot, I would honestly maybe do it like every 48 hours, just because um, with more heat, the sugars break down faster. Um, however, butterflies and things also do the same thing with scat. Like they will soak up the moisture and nutrients from, um, from that as well. So I think as long as you're not delinquent with your feeder and leave it go really long um, and there's ever like any kind of mold or any kind of weird stuff growing on there, but, um, yeah, I would just like have, I would just mostly have yourself on a schedule with your feeders, um, just because in general too, like even with normal bird feeders, you want to make sure not only are you feeding them or filling them, but maybe um, once a month with your seed feeders, whatever gets really low, um, instead of just refilling it, kind of emptying it out and then soaking it in a, um, a diluted bleach water solution and then giving it a really good rinse, drying it and then refilling it just because you want to limit um, any kind of possibility that um, birds could get sick from visiting your feeder. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's see, oh, uh, so what species of milkweed is best for monarch butterflies? Hmm. Well, in my experience, really it kind of, any kind of milkweed is great. It's more so what have, like what, um, or what kind of soil you have on your property that's best suited for the milkweed. So the only thing I can think of, which actually came up during um, Monarch Fest, is that here in like the Northeast, um, tropical milkweed is just, well, you should kind of avoid planting it in your yard annually because I don't, I'm not completely educated on um, the different, um, there's a, um, what is it, not a pesticide, a um, parasite called um, OE that can infect the um, caterpillar of the um, monarch. And then whenever it goes into chrysalis, it won't ever come out because the parasite has taken over um, the caterpillar. And the tropical milkweed is a bigger carrier of that. Um, and in our climate, it's more common. So I just would not plant tropical milkweed, but the really the difference between the common, the butterfly and the swamp milkweed is just kind of your habitat at your house. So Erica, if you have anything else to add. <laughs> no, um, some milkweeds are better. Like I, I think there's a, a milkweed that's okay in the shade. So if you're looking to fill like a specific area in your yard, like Adele was saying, maybe small swamp milkweed might be better in a wetter area. It's, it's more about where they want to grow. Mm -hmm. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Um, let's see here. So how far should we keep our pollinator plants away from a vegetable garden to keep larvae from eating our tomatoes, uh, other, other veggie garden plants? <laughs> um, and would you recommend a few companion plants for Northwestern New Jersey? If that's not something we can answer now, we could include that in the follow-up email. I'll just say that to the host. So. <laughs> Um, 
I can start with the uh, how far away. Um, honestly, I like to plant my plants close to my veggie garden because the closer they are, the easier they can get to the like cucumber flowers to pollinate them. Um, so if you have like an aster growing right outside your veggie garden, which is how I do it, um, there's pollinators um, pollinators on the flowers and they're going to pollinate your, you know, your squash and your tomatoes, all the vegetables that benefit from pollination. Um, so I would plant them pretty close by. Um, honestly, if you're supporting the general ecology, you're going to have um, beneficial insects along with your pollinators. So they will like, oh, the wasp will lay its eggs on the tobacco hornworm that's trying to eat your tomatoes, that kind of thing. So nature tends to balance itself out. Um, if you have the pollinators, you'll have the beneficial insects. Um, and, and I don't think you'd really have to worry too much about the insect damage to your vegetable garden. I think they'll benefit more so. Great, thank you. So do native plants self-seed after growing or do you need to plant new seeds each year? Um, that would depend on if they're perennial or not. So um, some of them will naturally reseed, but that would be something you'd wanna think about if they're perennials or annuals um, because certain plants will um, take like two years or they'll you know, come back every year. So that just kind of depends on um, whenever you want to plant them. Um, also, some plants, um, you can actually deadhead them to make their blooms um, last longer. So this doesn't work with like every plant, but um, certain ones, if you notice it's still early in the season and like all of your, like your big bush, like all of the flowers have been pollinated and they are kind of like going to seed, you can cut those off and then the plant will rebloom and then you'll have more flowers for pollinators to utilize throughout the year. Um, that's something else that you want to look at, like if it um, uh, is good, like for that plant specifically. Um, but that's just something to extend your the life of your of the of the blooms as well in your yard. And um, sorry, I just nope. would like to add um, some plants are more aggressive spreaders than others. And that some will um, spread by rhizomes and, and others by seed. So you kind of want to get to know the plant that you're planting. Um, like Monarda, for example, can spread pretty, pretty fast and maybe take over. Um, so just kind of get to know what you're planting, um, just so you know, one plant doesn't overpower everything. And I'm assuming you can also reach out to these garden centers, um, garden clubs, and ask them for recommendations for perennials and things like that, maybe more low maintenance plants uh, for people who are just getting started. Um, let's see here. Oh, this might be kind of a fun debate. So <laughs> if we can only plant one type of plant, what is the best one for pollinators? Ooh. Oh my God. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna go with it. I'm gonna say an oak tree. I know that's not even like one of the pollinator plants that we were talking about, but just in terms of the number of insect species that one plant can support, um, like I said in my presentation, an oak tree can support 500 species. So I'm gonna go with that. Okay, Adele, yeah. what are you thinking? Oh my gosh. I think whenever you said that, Erica, I started thinking about um, cedar trees, like a, like a pair, like it, like a male and female cedar tree, because though it's uh, those plants, you need um, two separate, you know, sexes of the plant to be able to create berries. But those berries just create like such a great food source for birds throughout the entire year, but also a lot of different insects utilize that as a host tree as well. So I guess, yeah, they aren't typical pollinator plants, but they're really great. So, um, but if, if you really wanted to get a variety of butterflies, but also bird life, I think like purple cone flowers are great to plant because they are late bloomers, but you can get the butterflies on them. And then if you don't cut the stems, leave them, 
and let the, you know, the flowers like dry up, then you can get um, these beautiful bright yellow American gold finches hanging off of your purple coneflower seeds. And it's just so beautiful. So if you want to go more traditional, I do that one. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so let's see. We've been leaving the leaves for the past few years. Is it okay to ever clean them out or is it best to leave them year after year and never clean them out? Adele, do you want to take it or do you want me to take it? You can take it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so it depends on how it's affecting where they are, where they're landing, I would say. Um, over time, they will break down, but they might... Um, shade the area that they're covering so if you're trying to grow um like a cover like a ground cover or, or something underneath the where the leaves are then um what i would recommend is maybe just blowing them to another spot where you don't necessarily care if there's um something growing there just because they might smother any um any growth that might be underneath them so Either way, what I don't recommend is putting them in a bag and throwing them out with your trash. Um, so you can move them wherever you want, but I wouldn't throw them out because um, there's probably something awesome living inside of them. And um, if you have a space, I know not everybody has a space where they can just make a pile of leaves, um, but if you have that or you can designate an area in your yard, um, there, you can just put this the stuff aside I would recommend doing that yeah and then also going along with that too um I mentioned like how you want to put compost into certain areas or like more um um organic material into your soil to make it more nutrient dense for your plants but if you leave those leaves and like um and it's kind of putting the nutrients back into the soil naturally. So that tree thrives in your yard. And so those leaves, all those nutrients from your soil are then getting put back into your, into your yard as well. So um, another great reason not to take your leaves out of the yard and into the landfill, so. Awesome. Um, it looks like we have time for one more question here. Um, okay, so let's see, uh, what are the best kinds of fruit for the, uh, the fruit feeder that you showed us the pictures of Adele? Oh, um, I'd say um, uh, bananas are great. If you just like, if, if you have a, I know my freezer is full of um, really uh, ripe bananas that I'm waiting to make banana bread out of. Um, <laughs> but if you ever are cleaning out your freezer, and you're like, oh my gosh, I, this is too many bananas. You can even just like split open that frozen banana, put it in the feeder and then it'll just kind of naturally um, go about. I've also done this too with like fruit that's in the freezer that has been so frost bitten that I've tried to make a smoothie out of it and it just tastes like my freezer and I will eat it because I don't like food waste but then you're like I don't want to use this fruit so you can put like berries out there but I think um, uh, definitely definitely like soft squishy fruit like maybe not apples might not like they would probably be fine but like berries and bananas are great because they get really soft and juicy so awesome well thank you both so much um that was such a fantastic presentation and just a reminder to everyone that is still with us um keep an eye out in your email early next week we will be sending out a follow-up email with the recording for this webinar as well as all of the resources that Adele and Erica um, referenced during this webinar the list of the the native plants and the the nursery list where you can get these plants um, so thank you all for joining us today and for, you know, continuing to support the Nature Conservancy and the Audubon Society. We will see you next time.